start the formal bit. And then record it. The editorial piece is over. This is as many students as we're going to get. It kills my one student rule. It's fine. So we're going to talk about strategy at the high level. That's sort of a blend. It's a blend between deliberate and emergent. And that's what makes sense. If you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have a starting point. But like every war, every battle plan, it becomes uh, irrelevant at first contact with the enemy. So you need to be emergent as well. You need both. So we use strategic leadership and planning, and we look, and sometimes if we're a government authority, for instance, uh, we're at the whim. I mean, think of Brexit at the moment. My goodness. What is going to happen in 10 days' time? That's going to be an externally imposed strategy on anybody exporting or importing to the UK and Northern Ireland. Oh, my goodness. That's where the contention is. You have to treat Northern Ireland differently because it's connected physically to the EU, to Ireland, and they don't want a hard border anymore because they fought many decades bloody war of bloody wars across, literally bloody wars across that border with the Troubles in Northern Ireland. They don't want to uh, reinstitute a hard border, but it is physically connected. So you have to treat Northern Ireland differently, but the DUP... Who, can, who are the representatives of Northern Ireland, they don't like it. They don't want like to. We don't want to be any different. But you are physically different. Anyway, let's see whether Boris can swing enough votes. We don't know. They've delayed it, delayed the vote, I think, till Wednesday. We don't know whether he'll swing enough votes to get approval for his latest Brexit deal. So that would be an example of something externally imposed. Uh, but... We also have emergent strategies, this idea of logical incrementalism. Uh, uh, and it can often result in a strategic drift as well. Sometimes it's very political, what goes on, the, the, the power, the influence. I mean, <laughs> Theresa May stood up and everybody, and she had a joke, everybody was laughing. Because <laughs> she says, I'm not going to oppose this <laughs> bill. <laughs> Uh, but I will oppose those who are opposing it. You know, anyway, it was so funny because Boris is presenting what could be a worse deal and what she, her deals were rejected. So that's an example of political processes here. This um, idea of charismatic leaders who carry through the strategy, which may not be very logical. Um, and sometimes we are constrained by our systems, organizational systems. They put a constraint on what we can do. So it's a blend of what we'd like to do and what the external environment imposes upon us. So strategic leadership is an idea of command, having a vision of decision-making. It can be the embodiment of strategy if you can take everybody with you, but you often can't. So we have this spectrum here of very deliberate, uh, this incremental steps, but then we have political processes that can get in the way, and also we have structures and systems that get into the way of our planning process. So the stages are, there might be guidelines coming from the corporate center here at this university. It's the building near the, there's a water fountain and a lake, if you hadn't noticed, on the other side of the university, and there's a little building there, which is the corporate center. And they're doing their planning, and then it's pushed down at the business level. Uh, then it, there's an integration of the business plans of all the faculties here. And it's always very uh, financial, financial targets, agreed budgets, and strategic targets, which might be a number of publications, which might be number of um, students, and overseas versus local for the university as an example. So we formulate strategy. It's good if we are a learning organization, learn from our mistakes, be able to integrate all of the ideas from our disparate business units, and then we have to communicate that. So additional benefits um, of this process is we can get buy-in. 
we can involve everybody. There can be a sense of ownership. There's some sense to, to, to security to managers that they've inputted into the strategy and they won't get left behind. Uh, and it can uh, be thought of as being logical. Of course, there are downsides as well. So we do confuse strategy with planning. That is, the strategic planning process is hijacked by the accountants. The accountants want to see budgets, and they want to see bottom-up budgets that meet the top-down guidelines. So you have to reverse engineer. Sometimes I've seen P&L statements, income statements, which have a line that says cost saving, minus whatever. Even though it doesn't add up, all of your expenses, budget expenses, adds up to a number that's too big. They simply put a line that says cost saving. In other words, you've got to somehow make this account, make this work, even though the numbers don't work. <sighs> so when the accountants take over, and you should set the strategy and then the numbers should follow, but often the numbers come first. So that's what it means, confusing managing strategy with planning, is it becomes a budgeting financial exercise and the strategies have to be reverse engineered to fit the budgeted targets. And what happens is you either meet them or you don't. If you meet the targets, you're a hero, you get your bonus, all is well, in American companies anyway. If you don't meet your targets, uh-oh, that's trouble, and they may well ax you, and then they put someone else in, and then someone else in gets a honeymoon. Well, this requires restructuring. Clearly, this was all done wrong. It takes a while to turn the ship around. They get a honeymoon for a year or two, and if they've been smart enough and are able to push the business down low enough during this, this honeymoon period, they can then come back to the numbers where you had two years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> it doesn't work, in other words. It doesn't work. Um, Poor Ahmed Fahour, he was a very senior executive at NAB Bank and he was passed over and he said, well, stuff you. And he became the CEO of Australia Post. And Australia Post was going through a difficult time. Why? Why do you think Australia Post might be having a troubled time? Wow. Now, yeah. Snail mail. Don't rely on letters so much. There's something that's been replacing letters? What's that? Email. Email. Exactly. Uh, yeah, we're not, but we're not, we're not using as much mail. So Ahmed faced this situation of very declining revenues and declining profitability. And in fact, the directive for Australia Post is to sell, is to sell assets to meet any shortfall in profitability. His solution to the problem was postage went up, I think it was 70 cents. So he put postage up to a dollar and it'll take twice as long or you can pay a dollar 50 and it'll be the usual snail mail of a few days. But if you don't put a dollar 50 at a dollar, it'll take a, at least a week. We'll, we'll store it away somewhere in a warehouse and then we'll think about delivering it to you. That was his solution the problem? Of course not. Well, it's a very temporary measure that where customers are not using your service, double, double the price and halve the service. Is, is this in Beg your pardon? He did. He got, he got paid very well and he's left. And left it in the usual mess it was. It's okay because parcel post is growing, but they need to restructure the, the whole concept here around parcels, which is different to, to, to letters, but he really didn't. He, you know. And then he's now tried to launch Latitude, a new, new financial services company, and they pulled it. They pulled the launch. There wasn't enough subscription to it, not, not enough overseas investors, and no overseas investors, to a new financial services company called Latitude, so what I'm saying is that you, you sometimes have to face the realities. You can bring in a hot shot, Ahmed Fahur, a big hot shot, and he may just simply be adding oil to the fire. Uh, that sometimes we defy reality. 
So strategy, that's why I love the case studies. Amsterdam couldn't do it, couldn't become a smart city, you know. Um, uh, GE overreached with Predix. Siemens, in partnership with SAP, seemed to be a bit smarter in how to move to the IoT, big data, machine learning, predictive, prescriptive maintenance uh, paradigm, how to move to this paradigm. GE, too quickly, too much. Look at Boeing with the 737 MAX. It's destroyed their earnings. That's why the share market, Wall Street, uh, dropped uh, yesterday because of shocking results from Boeing because all of their 737 MAXs are grounded and all their airline customers are asking for compensation. Not only are we not buying anything from you, we want compensation for these airlines that won't, these planes that won't fly. So it's an art, strategy is an art. And again, they, they really messed up because they had this MAX system, M-A-C-S system, which uh, in emergencies kicked in, which uh, uh, detects whether uh, uh, the, 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 the plane is about to stall and it pushes the nose down. And when there was faulty air, airflow sensors, two, two aeroplanes, an Ethiopian airline and I think an AirAsia airline, two airlines anyway, plummeted to the ground because this max, and they knew, they knew that this was a potential problem in the system, but if they highlighted we have a new system, and this is how to override it, overcome it, they'd have to retrain all the pilots, have to be all recertified, that would be costly to their customers. So the 737 MAX is released without an, any new training, nothing new, nothing new, nothing new, just got better range, better better fuel efficiency, no, 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 pilots, and so the poor pilots had no idea what is going on with this plane and fought, fought with the plane. So again, that's really bad strategy. So we see examples of good strategy and bad strategy here. Yes, this detachment from reality. Ahmed Fahu, detached from reality. Boeing, thinking that they can launch the MAX with its uh, MAX, with its MACS. That's ironic, isn't it? MAX and MACS is pronounced MAX as well, and the MAX with the MAX system. And not have to retrain the pilots. Um, and the Americans call it drinking their own Kool-Aid. He is believing their own bullshit. Um, and sometimes it is analysis paralysis, paralysis by analysis, uh, overthinking it sometimes, and that's over complex. And sometimes it does dampen innovation because can you guarantee that this expenditure will result in this return? No, I can't. So we won't do it. And you pull out investment. You pull out investment because uh, the result is not certain. You strip out um, opportunity here. So it can be the reverse of the, the entrepreneurial effect. So strategies are uh, externally imposed. Of course, governments and governments can shape regulated industries like utilities and multinationals uh, imposed by host governments. I talked about uh, local alliance. Yes, I talked about that. That American companies have to buy their European subsidiaries, otherwise pay very high market introduction fees. Business units may have the strategy imposed by the head office. Certainly, if you are a multinational, that is true. And venture capital firms impose strategies on the companies in which they invest. So emergent on the basis of series of decisions forms a pattern that becomes clear over time. So it's not a grand plan. It can't be predicted that um, here uh, um, uh, it be can become emergent. It can become uh, less, less, less deliberate. So logical incrementalism, the development strategy by experimentation and learning from partial commitments rather than through global formulations of total strategies. Hence, Afia, I think you asked, what do I mean by uh, uh, the process model, the pilots? It's this idea of anything new should have a partial commitment. Should be thought of as an option. We're going to invest a bit of money for the option to proceed with this new technology, this new concept, the option but not the obligation. And that's how we experiment, that's how we learn, that's how we deal with uncertainty and risk is we control the risk. So we have environmental uncertainty with our customers. 
what will be the fashion. I just read an article. If you want to get a home loan, don't use Afterpay. So interesting. So that's an e really an interesting example of uh, environmental uncertainty. Because of the Hain Royal Commission, our banks are ridiculously vigilant, ridiculously tough in lending at the moment, maybe too much so. And we have another emergent trend of younger people love after pay, you know, for equal, equal installments, etc. And now the banks have decided if you uh, avail yourself of that, you're not a good credit risk. Maybe true, maybe not true. But that's how things change. Yeah. No, younger people are great. If, for instance, you have a degree, you have a job, you have a salary, a bank wants to give you a nice big loan to sign you up for life. <laughs> so you spend the rest of your life paying back the loan and paying them interest. You couldn't be a better customer. But not if you use Afterpay. So who would have thought? Who would have thought that they discriminate against Afterpay customers? Can they? They insist. They want to see everything, all your credit card statements. They want to see... Uh, one guy got rejected for a loan because he didn't include the $10 a day he spent on a kebab for lunch. <laughs> it's a true story. So, yes, they're, 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 they're extraordinarily uh, nosy, uh, ridiculously so. so. But the point is that uh, these are just examples of change, right? How, how, how our environment keeps changing. Um, uh, general goals of voting, too early commitment, that's true too. We, we don't want uh, an early commitment because uh, we don't know how fruitful, how profitable a particular direction will be. And we want to be able to experiment. So the learning organizations... Learning organizations have a culture of experimentation, a culture that failure is fine. What did we learn from it? Try and fail. Whereas organizations that stifle learning, they punish failure. So nobody wants to experiment and everybody wants to blame somebody else when things go wrong because you'll be punished otherwise. And we find the bigger and more bureaucratic organizations tend to stifle creativity, the smaller, uh, more flexible one. And we have a really interesting debate after the break is how innovative is Apple? It's a really interesting question because I've read a lot of articles on this and I find that the writers take either side of the fence. You can argue either side. Uh, well, we'll say it. We'll he will hear your views later. That's right. You knew what I was going to say here. Because Apple is large. And it's, it's um, you know, Tim Cook is remunerated based on share price. Share price is determined by earnings. And sometimes to drive short-term earnings, you sacrifice long-term goals. Short-term opportunism. So he's in a very tough bind. So... In form, large, large organizations have got these formal systems which stifle creativity. Um, and top managers shouldn't be like Steve Jobs, shouldn't be the micromanager. They, they should encourage a percolation up. Lego, Lego almost went broke. Lego uh, were, were making uh, you know, uh, products that people didn't want because they had a centralized creative department and they lost touch with their market and only by decentralizing, by having, you know, a, a Lego portal, a Lego community and listening to their community and building anything that, that had enough votes for it, were they able to save, save the company. So it's an example that the centrally controlled top-down approach in this very complex world of ours doesn't work. And one of the smartest things Steve Jobs did was the App Store, iTunes and the App Store. Who could predict which apps would gain traction? Did anybody still play Candy Crush? No. See? Uh, uh, what, Angry Birds? 
Yeah, a few of you, there we are. Who knows? Who knows? I have no idea what you're mucking around with on your phones. It's going to change, it can change by the minute. Someone recommends something to you and you download it and go, oh yeah, this is fun. Um, so rather than try and predict what would work and have a development team writing all this software, is we just take 30% of everything that's sold. We don't mind the free stuff either because that promotes the ecosystem and makes our phone more useful. Those banking apps and everything makes it all more useful. Free stuff is okay, we'll support it, but uh, we like getting revenue too from the stuff that's being sold. So that's an idea, that's a very creative, that's a very much an experimentation approach. It was a, a very ingenious idea, making the platform open to everybody. And then strategy can be political, my goodness, powerful interest groups. Poor Boris Johnson trying to get a Brexit, I feel sorry for him really, trying to get a Brexit deal because you've got the hard Brexiteers, no negotiation, you've got those who oppose Brexit altogether, this DUP, we don't want Northern Ireland to be treated differently. For goodness sake, it's attached to the EU, physically stitched together, you know. You're Northern Ireland, you're attached to Ireland, Ireland is part of the EU. Oh. No, we don't want uh, uh, these restrictions. There would be, it would be more restrictive for Northern Ireland. It would be partly in the EU for, you know, customs and everything. Any, any Northern Irish um, exporter would need pre-approval before you can export because there's no border with the EU, with, with Ireland. So of course it needs to be treated differently. Yes, it's a pain, but uh, and they didn't vote. Northern Ireland didn't didn't you know voted against Brexit, <laughs> and Scotland wants to separate anyway. They voted against Brexit, and they want to be their own own country again. So uh, here you have uh, all of this politics, lots of bargaining and negotiation, and sometimes you end up like our coalition government doing nothing. Nothing about climate change, nothing about energy, not doing anything because that's the easiest approach. No, zero, zero leadership in certain areas. So politics is immensely frustrating. So different approach uh, uh, from people's position and personal experience, like Tony Abbott, thank goodness he was ousted. Uh, he opposed everything. Competition sometimes for resources and influence. There's very there's the relative influence of stakeholders, different access to. There can be an asymmetric access to to information. So politics can be very dysfunction. Can result, result in uh, I've given you too many political stories already. Strategy sometimes it is making sense of systems and routines which which we're familiar. We are caught in this university by systems and routines. The concept is that we have a talking head and you're glued to, to uncomfortable plastic chairs. You hate it. I mean less than half of you bother to attend. Those who do attend usually come late. And then after the break there's a stampede for the door. Right, with maybe a third of you staying. Does that make any sense? Don't worry, my SPED 102, and they're, they're straight out of school, you know, and they first start attending the tutorials. I mark the attendance and everything. Out of about 35, I don't know, 28, in fact, I was looking at my other folder here, 28 attend, and I'm down to four, four, six, nine. Yeah, the afternoon class are more, that's just random, are more, more, uh, more enthusiastic. Four, six, and nine. They've worked it out. They don't need to attend. It's not mandatory. And yet the tutorial embodies the uh, lecture material and the concepts and makes sense of the concepts. An exceptionally well-designed tutorial. These, you know, the guy who designed this is a superb constructivist educationalist really, really good. That's why I really enjoy being part of it. He made it work to begin with, but then they changed all the, all the rules just to soften everything, make it, make it more comfortable, I don't know, but um, clearly f um, failed, absolutely, totally failed. So we have systems and routines here 
that are so ingrained that when they become dysfunctional, there isn't the leadership to change them. That's sad, isn't it? I think it's sad. Uh, so, we are bound, are bound by um, our routines, because routines are comfortable, even when they're failing, even when the stakeholders are rejecting the routine, we still maintain the routine. So, strategy can be this product of structures and systems here, that um, each of our business units has uh, an environment here and they develop systems and routines and this is all fed up in this sort of random approach here back to the head office. This, this uh, lacks leadership, this is a strategic drift and this will end up in calamity eventually. Eventually it will fail. Um, it can be due to a continued continuity of prior decisions, which can, can be effective. You launch a product, you invest in a market, you uh, invest in the resources, and then you have related diversification. So there was one of these movies on Steve Jobs. It was the era up to about 2000 when um, he was kicked out of uh, Apple and um, he, he went and uh, built uh, Nexus computers and uh, he got involved with Pixar and Toy Story. He did some very clever things and then he came back to, to Apple to try and save them. At the end of the movie, he's using a Sony Walkman and he takes the device and throws it in the bin. So that was the very first when Apple thought about consumer electronics away from computing, it used to be called Apple Computer, and thought about MP3 players. It's not as if Apple invented the MP3 player. The eye was stolen from iRiver. iRiver had a de detachable battery, a replaceable battery, a color screen. I never understood uh, the iPod with the silly wheel. Anybody ever had one of those? Did you like it? Yeah, it felt like more futuristic. There you are. So he appealed to, to the right generation. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was immensely successful. But that's the example here of this product launch, the iPod. It became... Um, it, it continued to develop with a color screen and uh, can, a bit of processor and can handle apps. And then he turned it into the iPhone. Seventy percent of Apple's turnover today is from the iPhone, which came from the iPod. So it, this can work. And then Samsung was simply developing components for Apple and thought, gee, this is a great market. And Samsung launched their own smartphone, the Galaxy, and look where it's taken them. And they've succeeded. Whereas Nokia and Ericsson, mm-mm, mm-mm. So most organizations have these uh, different processes, and there's no run one, one right way. The truth is there's a lot of delusion that goes on. Organizations love to delude themselves that they have this very deliberate strategy and it's top down and the middle managers kowtow to the management. But at the coalface, they do as they please. They do their own thing and sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Sometimes results in a lack, poor lack of coordination as well. So it's much better if, if the uh, senior management is got good sensing capability, can sense the environment, sense the, this bottom-up, these ideas coming from customers. We talk about Coca-Cola and they're always introducing, uh, they've made a lot of money in America from the Mini, from this small Coke can. Can you believe it? You know, the packaging costs more than the bit of sugar and water inside. Yeah? It's, it's very cost-inefficient to put Coke in a little tin. And yet it's, it's, it's had double digit, 35% uh, growth or something. Why? Why do you think small tins of Coke in America are selling so well? 
Beg your pardon? No, no, no alcohol in it. No. No, no, no. Beg pardon? No, yeah, but no, they don't. They, they sometimes have big bottles, sometimes can. Aeroplanes have all sorts of configurations. No, no, no. See, you can't guess. You can't guess, you see. You don't even know why they did it and why it's so successful. It, it's ridiculous why. Why? Yeah, and you pay double. Oh, it's scary. No. And no. <laughs> Any other ideas? You still haven't gotten it. <laughs> convenient. Is it convenient to, 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 to be so cost inefficient? To pay two bucks for half the size? No. 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 Hmm? But it's not saving. It's... It, it, No, we, we like the better, yeah, no, we like the better value. And you can toss half the tin if you can't for tuna. Yes, yes, yes. No, you're wrong. It's because, this is ridiculous, this is really ridiculous, but this is what the article said. It's because we're becoming more health conscious. <laughs> So we know that this is full of caffeine and full of sugar, and we know it's better for us if we drink less. But we don't want to go for the diet or the um, Coke Zero because that has got chemicals in it. Whereas the regular Coke, that doesn't have chemicals. Oh, no, you know. No, no. Look, it's two dollars fifty for the regular size, right. and it's two dollars for half the size. Uh, so per per mil, it's almost double. That's my comment. Oh, okay. Because the packaging costs like ten cents for each, right? Half a cent difference maybe in packaging cost, size, yeah. and the water and sugar in there. I don't know, another three cents, okay. right? So, so it's incredibly uh, cost inefficient. The, the market's growing be for this ridiculous idea that we're becoming more health conscious. Therefore, it's healthier to drink less Coke. And in a serve, to drink a smaller can is healthier for you. I would have thought it's healthier to take the Coke and throw it in the bin <laughs> and not drink it at all. So my point, you couldn't guess it. They couldn't guess it. They experiment. They're a learning organization. They experiment. They have soda fountains where they ask people to mix, you know, different flavors of Sprite and Coke and everything, and they get the data from that, and they see how people are blending flavors, creating new flavors. They're very much a marketing company, and all you're selling is sugar and water, Coke is it. Coke's the real thing, you know? They're a fan phenomenal marketing company. Very experimental, very creative, very emergent. Who says that the CEO can sit at his desk or her desk and determine, right, we're going to launch mini cans. I think it's a good idea. Someone tells me they look cute. <laughs> <laughs> They're right. <laughs> but, sir, uh, that's really cost inefficient costs us just as much and we deliver half the sugar and water to the customer. So how would they ever have guessed? So what? No, I'm just saying, no it's, it's in, do you understand the inefficient? You're arguing yeah. about the inefficiency. No, I, no, I know, I know. Per mill, it's inefficient. Definitely, no, definitely. That's my point. But people are going for it and I've already explained why. This comes down to an old story about Henry Ford. When, when asked, if we get a focus group together and we ask people before, you know, the Model T Ford, what would you like to see in transport? What do you think the focus group of customers would say? No, they, they, they know what they want. You know what they want? Faster horses.
So, there's no right way. That's Henry Ford having the vision. Can't ask the customers. They have no idea what a car is. And people like uh, Elon Musk believe in that, and Steve Jobs did too. You, you have, to, have to build something, you know, technology push rather than technology pull. Or Coke is you experiment. And that's the only real way is experimentation. And who knows where the market will go. So perceptions, senior, senior executives tend to see strategies intended rational, analytical. Middle managers see it as cultural and political because they see the reality. This is the vision, and that's the reality. Managers in public sector, it's very much externally imposed. For instance, we have an NDIS, National Disability Insurance Scheme. It's very new. It's multi-billion dollar. It's very equitable. The idea is that people with disabilities, they have such a wide range of physical, intellectual impairments that every, every disability plan should be tailored to the individual disability, right? That's what the NDIS is all about. But there's only 3,000 government employees working on the NDIS, and it's estimated that they need 15,000. So they're not spending the money. It's one of the big budget boosters in this financial year has been the lack of spending on the NDIS. They haven't spent the money because they don't have the caseworkers to approve the case plans, and they save money. Is that logical? It's terrible. We have underemployment, 14% underemployment, 14% of it don't, uh, don't get enough hours, enough work that we want. We're at 5.3%, climbing from 5.2%, but un underemployment rising. We have the labor force to be hired by the government to become NDIS case workers. We have the people. The government has the budget but they just don't spend it. So that's an example of public sector dysfunction and politics. People in family business are powerful individuals, and this is very functional. See, in a family business, if you serve the customer well, with good price, good service, your business flourishes, if you don't treat your customers well, don't deliver value, they go to the business next door. They go to your competition. If you're not friendly, think about the small businesses you visit, the coffee shops, the restaurants, the beauty stores. My wife has a nail shop, so I see this every day. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, and she's very, very good with people, can really read people. But my point is that in small businesses, the strategy is very, very direct. That the owner of the business will direct their staff exactly the way he or she. She manages her shop exactly how she wants it to be. All the rules <laughs> of her shop and how she trains the staff. And if somebody is, is not efficient, not, sl you know, not, not good, but they'll listen, she'll, she'll persevere with them, but the staff, she's axed to those who won't listen. Just won't do it her way, it's her shop, you're not doing it my way, see ya. It's as simple as that. Uh, so, they, and, and this is for, this is the law of the jungle. The fittest survive that the small business will not survive if it can't deliver. And so it needs high productivity from its staff. It needs its staff to be customer-focused, build customers. She tells, to, tells always her staff, you have to build customers for me. You have to talk to the customer. <laughs> uh, so our strategy is, is dictated by, by the entrepreneurial owner. Or very purposefully. Um, organizations' characteristics differ in terms of their size and form and complexity. The nature of the environment differs. The life cycle of the product differs too. So we have very different contexts for how we develop strategy. So 
in terms of the context, it can be difficult to understand. It can be simple or highly complex, and the uncertainty could be static or dynamic. So here, this university thinks everything is simple and static, and life goes on the same 50 years ago. It's the same, same, same. Same lecture theaters. It's just not called E7B. It's called something I can't even remember. 14 SCO. Whoever he is, I have no idea who he is. Do you know who he was? just has a very complicated name. Yeah, but who was he? But anyway, about 50 years ago, it was E7B. E7B. That's the only change that's happened. It's the same lecture theatres. It's the same talking head, except 50 years ago, they were probably full. And now nobody wants to attend. And they can't see that something, something's changed. So that's this example of historical analysis, past experience. They think they understand it, and they think it's static, and maybe they're a bit delusional. Here, if we can understand it, but it's very dynamic, then think in terms of scenarios and plan different scenarios is a very good approach. If it's highly complex and dynamic, then we have to have this devolution downwards of strategic thinking and influence. We have to those at the coal face. It has to come from the customers who are going to guide us. What are the new trends? What is the condition where um, thinkers understand what's going on? Like thinkers and analysts understand what's going on. Um, banking, banking and finance. It's simple to understand. We uh, get money uh, at a certain uh, uh, interest rate and we lend it at a higher interest rate. Isn't that what banks do, right? But it's simple to understand, but it's quite dynamic because we have lowering interest rates. Our margins are being squeezed. We can't pay depositors nothing, then they won't give us their money. That's why banks are not passing on the full uh, reserve bank easing. So, so that's a complexity. We have the Hain Royal Commission and APRA breathing down our neck that we have to um, uh, show why we are proving loans, and we, we have to use a much, much higher level of diligence. Commonwealth Bank is divesting its insurance arm. It's divesting its entire wealth management arm because they got caught out in the Hain Royal Commission. The culture is just not consistent with the regulators, and they are selling those businesses. So those are all scenarios here. Finance is simple. Come insure. We take insurance policy. We use actu act act actuarials who work out what the probability is, and we make sure on balance we're going to make money, and we reinsure anyway with our insurance companies to cover ourselves. So the insurance business is very well known. Yet come insure is selling their business because they relied on old definitions. This is for life insurance, and they, they refused to pay out, and they got caught by the Royal Commission, and they have to pay compensation, and their reputation is trashed. So that's an example. These are all scenarios that they have to plan. It's dynamic. Fine, Ahmed Fahur wanted to launch Latitude, a new, new financial services company, and the overseas investors said, not interested, and he cancelled cancelled the whole launch. So we have this uncertainty, this dynamism, even though these quite in simple financial products are quite simple to understand. Okay? Simple, static, dynamic, complex. So in, con in the strategy journal, in different contexts, the top management, so depending on the con context, it depends how top-down or bottom-up it is. Different strategy development roles at organizational levels, depending on your level of authority. Um, sometimes inflection points, I think this university is at an inflection point where we've got huge traction in online environments, micro-masters, and to not participate in this burgeoning online delivery, I think is, is a huge mistake, huge mistake. So I think we are at an inflection point here. We'll see. Um, often a deliberate strategy is just not realized. It's unworkable or unacceptable. Um, 
those, com you know, there's self-delusion that goes on. There's cognitive biases here. They have a deliberate strategy that they espouse, but the organization might be something different in reality. Um, uh, the management might think that they're delivering great customer service, but the customers might say, no, this service is terrible, and they are deluded. Um, Sir Reginald Ansett established uh, Ansett Airlines, and he was, he was a, uh, a billionaire until Ansett collapsed. And his son, Bob Ansett, uh, formed, uh, created Budget, Budget Rent-A-Car. And Bob was different. He was American-educated. He was different to his father. And Bob insisted that all his managers spent one week a month on the counter serving customers. One week a month, out of your office, at the counter, giving keys, checking cars out, checking cars in, and listening to the customers. That was brilliant. So often management is just not close enough to the customers. Feedback is very important. Uh, communication gives rise to immediate feedback. Control systems are necessary. Uh, to be able to have effective complaints management. Um, and in terms of managing emergent strategy, you have to be entrepreneurial. You have to be uh, more agile. You have to be ready to change course. Uh, the problem is if you are bound by your existing systems here, that steady as she goes, it's business as usual, you suffer strategic drift. This outcome of influence, political processes, organized structure and systems, and prior decisions. And strategic drift can result in calamity, as we've seen before. So this chapter on strategic development process, again, confirms that strategy is an art. And although we, we, the accountants want to see it as something deliberate and planned and financial, bless you, uh, uh, the reality is uh, that it needs to be entrepreneurial and needs to, meet, needs to be more bottom-up and not top-down. Otherwise, you have huge dysfunction, as we have here. As a very interesting example of failed strategy. doesn't have to be. So leadership, the final, what's the answer, Ian, then? If there is all this dysfunction, if it's such an art, if it's all so difficult, what do we do? It requires leadership. But we don't vote for the right leaders. We voted for Scott Morrison. Uh, the, the, the British voted for, well, the party. Uh, the Tory party voted for Boris Johnson. The Americans voted for Donald Trump. We are voting in terrible leaders, populist leaders, who tell us what we want to hear. <sighs> That's unfortunate. So we need leadership. So we need strategic leadership, and the, the style depends on the context, the type of change, and what levers are available. So the most effective leaders adopt a style to situation match. It was so funny. I bought this unit in Manly. I'm really happy with it. It's on Manly Cove on the waterfront. The building is 1966. But it's very well built, very well maintained, but, and it has a pool on the, in, on the water, on Manly Cove, and maritime services would never allow that, uh, you know, in this era, everything. So there are a lot of advantages, but you know, it has to be an old building to be on the waterfront, basically. And I live in Chatswood, and I can't move there at the moment, and so um, I'm going to rent it out for a few years until I'm ready to move there. And there's complaints. Uh, 21 groups came to have a look last Saturday on the unit. 21. I mean, it's a spectacular view. But they're complaining about the carpet. And I'm thinking, WTF, you know. What's wrong with the goddamn carpet? Why are you complaining? You know, it's original condition. I'm going to gut the whole thing. You know, I'm going to take out the kitchen, take put wooden floorboards. But I don't, don't want to re-carpet the thing now. What was wrong with it? 
goodness sake, why are they complaining? So my answer was, take the wife for a nice lunch in Manly. I love Manly. For 40 years I've been going to Manly. One day I'll be living there. But we'll go for a nice lunch, go for a lovely walk, and I'll meet the agent and find out what the story is. I can't believe the old woman, she blames the woman, maybe it was one of her kids, because she's in a nursing home now, everything. Th she knew it was being painted, and what she did was she cut the carpet about two inches from the wall to stop the carpet from interfering with the painting and exposing at the edge of the carpet his nails as a strip of nails that stick out to hold the carpet. They're all exposed. And because it was furnished, you know, I never looked at it. I worried about the view. I worried about lots of strategic things, not something tactical like that. Didn't worry about it and everything. And with the furniture removed, the bed and the setting and everything, oh my God, you can see it. That's what all the renters are seeing, this exposed carpet. You know, it can't be repaired. Anyway, I talked about solutions with, with the agent. And later I rang her and said, I oh, just, just replaced the carpet in the bedroom and hallway. It won't match. I don't care whether it's going to match. It's expensive. No, no, use polypropylene. Use the cheapest carpet you can find. This is the cheapest solution. Yes, we have to fix it, right? But you know, when I met her, we talked about a $100,000 refurb she did on an apartment she bought in Manly. She bought a w large one bedroom and she turned it into two bedroom. What she did was make a bedroom out of the kitchen and move the kitchen. And she showed us how you can move the services of the kitchen across and showed us we could make it from a two bedroom to a three bedroom. Because I said, we're going to gut the whole thing. This kitchen's 1966. For goodness sake, you know, the wooden cupboards that don't, don't quite close and <laughs> it brings, brings childhood memories back, you know. Uh, um, anyway, so, and I, and she understood. She understood immediately. I'm talking about whether to spend 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 dollars to fix the carpet with the non-matching polypropylene cheapest possible alternative in one breath. In the next breath, talking about ripping out the entire kitchen, putting a bedroom there and moving the kitchen across with a fancy, and she showed us the pictures of what she did. She did a buy, reno, sell. She flipped it. Well, she's an agent, a real estate agent. She's a smart cookie too. And, and that was a successful one. I wonder how many weren't successful. That was a particularly successful one that she did, right? And, and, I, and including holding costs, it was 100 grand. So I won't pay $2,000 on the carpet. Forget that. But I'm talking about 100 grand refurb in the same breath. I'm managing as a stingy landlord for temporary tenants. They're paying a little less on the rent because it's an original condition. I certainly understand that. It's not cost efficient for me to refurb the whole thing to get a higher rent. My ROI is, and strategically, it's a stupid thing to do because they might wreck it. Give them the old 1966 unit, accept whatever the market rent is appropriate for the, for the accommodation. And they had 21 groups through, so, and three applications already. So I think I can rent it. It's rentable, it's livable, but they are complaining about the carpet. And I can now see, what <laughs> never occurred to me someone would be so dumb. I mean, you, 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 you get a $2 roll of, of, of two, two inch tape, cellar tape, and, and you run that round there, and you don't need to cut the car. Was it like that when you bought it? Of course it is. No, but it was, it was furnished. But uh, I bought it at auction, and the auction could have gone 100 grand higher anyway. The two grand or whatever at auction, and we wouldn't have bad an eyelid, I would have, you know, uh, anyway. 
so do you see the style to situation match? In the same breath, and Marlena, the, uh, the property manager, understood perfectly that she's dealing with a hard-nosed landlord and then dealing with a friend. Here's some friendly advice as to what you might consider when you're ready to, to do the refurb. Some free advice. I'm listening to both. So that's an example today of style to situation match. You have to match your management to the situation. And that's leadership. So in terms of managing change, which is very difficult because there's huge resistance to change here, you have to look at the context, the forces blocking or facilitating the change, how to identify the type of change and what levers you have. I have a very good story for you that comes out of the text. I'm sure you've all read it in, 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 in preparation for tonight. You've, you've read the chapter, haven't you? Yes, yes, of course you have. And then you would have noted that there's a very, I like this because it's a business school, it's, it's, it's a university example. And I can really empathize with the massive resistance. You can't get academics to do anything like herding cats because the culture is one where they're hired for their distinctive research capability. So they're intelligent people, smart people. They, they get promoted to associate professor, professor, you know, dean, whatever, based on the, uh, the cap their research capabilities. Nothing to do with their teaching. Um, nothing to do with their administration skills, whether they're director of a program or whatever. That's just seen as tedium. Um, it's the research here. And so they, they have to be individualistic uh, and distinctive. And it means that they don't comply with anything. And if they're putting out good research, you can't touch them. Untouchable. No, the, the idea is, the thinking is, that the um, curriculum is research-based. But none of them are doing any research in the management of IT, of course. Yeah, I know. Nobody's doing any research in, in your course, but some people, they, we've got some of our uh, uh, staff members are doing research in security. Yeah, Christoph Dosh, he's doing yeah, security. He might be very up to date with, with all the latest. I don't know. Could be. Yeah, Good, see? There's an alignment of the planets. So there's an alignment. Sometimes the planets align, <laughs> right? Sometimes the research done by the academic is actually relevant to what they're teaching. More is a random process than anything else, but it's possible. But this is the story. So there was a new dean, George Yip, and he was required to increase revenue by improving contacts with and relevant to business. And this is a business school. It's the Rotterdam School of Management here. And not only do they have to have better contacts and relevance to business, but have to maintain the academic reputation. And he had a four-year contract. He had four years to make this happen. And they had a culture of consensus building through long discussions that would be typical of academics, meetings, endless, endless, long, boring meetings. He needed to avoid announcing the need for major change, which would create a resistance immediately. So you have to sneak up on them. So what he found was only 1% of articles were published in top managerial journals such as the Harvard Business Review. So he brought in editors to train staff on, on how to write for, for the business, top business publications, what they're looking for. And he instituted a 15,000 euro cash bonus, about 30,000 Australian dollars. So you get $30,000 if you publish a paper in a top business journal. It's not a bad incentive. 15,000 euro. And he wants a target of 5%. Go from 1% to 5%. That means 95% is still academic, but 5% from 1% in top business journals. He'd have a list of journals. 
He didn't attend doctoral dissertations. Instead, had a priority of engaging with corporate executives. <coughs> Senior academics involved with advisory board meetings had to present research to top executives, and it had to be relevant. Annual conferences with panels of executives and faculty and events for faculty and practitioners, management practitioners. He replaced his opponents. He promoted a supporter to vice dean. He said he rearranged the deck of cards there. He created a director of external relations with a director of marketing, and he put them on the management committee. He delayed discussion of a new strategy until year three. He did it first and then talked about it later. The strategy succeeded in changing the mindset of the faculty with the need to connect with business. Uh, the, his vice dean replaced him as dean after four years. And then he moved on. Uh, Richard Pascali says, it's easier to act your way into a better way of thinking than to think your way into a better way of acting. JFDI. He just did it. Now that's strategic leadership. That's showing everybody what I'm interested in, what I want to see, where I'm spending my time, where you're going to be rewarded, and you oppose me, you're fired. And you're with me, you're promoted. I thought it's beautiful. How do you institute change? He instituted change. He rewarded. It's carrot and stick. It's not totalitarian. Totalitarians all stick. This is carrot and stick. Uh, bonuses, uh, uh, um, hiring uh, edit, you know, trainers, how to edit. Uh, I'm only interested in, in the presentations you're giving to business. I'm only interested in our joint business um, uh, functions, you want to get on the right side of me, they're the functions to attend, that's how you'll get promoted, actively oppose me. And I'll get rid of you. Yeah, Rotterdam, Rotterdam. Rotterdam School of Management, Rotterdam. North of Amsterdam, very big port. But it's a story from, and I loved it, I thought that's a great story, gee, that's a man of my own heart. That's what you have to do. From Europe. <laughs> Who? Why? Why would they want to? And how many students would attend? <laughs> anyway, suffice suffice with the story. So, so very good leadership. What are you doing? I was really tough on the property manager about the stupid carpet, right? Not paying for recarpeting the thing. We we'll just carpet the hallway and the and the bedroom where it's cut, and I want the cheapest polypropylene carpet where you can find. And put it on service seeking, I told her. Serviceseeking.com.au. It's where I get the cheapest deals. I was really tough on her. She knows. I think we're talking about a hundred grand <laughs> in the same breath. <laughs> she, she, so so no. If you 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 want to lead, you Going to be tough. Get out of it. You don't be a pussy cat. Because you've got your opponents. You've got to plow through, break through. So leadership is this process of influencing an organization or a group in the effort toward achieving an aim or a goal. You have to envisage your strategy, then align the organization. Align the organization. Promote the supporters and fire the opponents. That's what aligning means. And then you have to live the change. You have to act the change. You have to show what counts, what's important. I negotiated with her on how she's going to set the rent. It's advertised at the moment, offers over 800 a week, if anybody wants to put an offer in. Offers over, over, over. Let them compete with each other to rent my 1966 kitchen. Tough. You've got to be tough. It's business. She works for me. It doesn't work, doesn't work for the renter. It doesn't work for you guys. She works for me. I pay her commission. Get me the rent. 
Reduce by cost. Otherwise, you're fired. So middle managers don't just implement strategy, but key roles. They advise. They make sense of it. They reinterpret it. And so you, you have to have the middle management on side here. So we've got, like Steve Jobs, this idea of a transformational or charismatic leader. There's another story with um, Statia Nadella, who took over from Steve Ballmer. So Steve Ballmer was a disaster for Microsoft. Steve Ballmer had this idea that you know Microsoft um, innovate through teams, and each team should nominate the bottom five percent of members on the team, and they will be fired from Microsoft. He only wants good players. So. Something innovative is, is being announced, and you've got the opportunity to join a team. Are you going to go and join a team? You're pretty good, by the way. Imagine you're pretty good. Are you going to join a team of A-grade players? No. You're going to look for the B or C team, because I'm pretty good, so I won't be ditched. <laughs> it was a huge disincentive to try hard and to work in a good team. Because you might be the bottom of that team and you might be axed. So Satya Nadella succeeded him and turned Microsoft around. Microsoft is now eclipsed. Apple is now the number one company in the world by market capitalization. Microsoft, Azure, Cloud. Satya Nadella led Microsoft into cloud competing. So the, so the inventor of the desktop, Windows, the desktop DOS, it used to be our DOS, rough and dirty operating system. That's where DOS came from, dirty operating system, the disk operating system, where it was rough and dirty. From, from the PC era transitioning to the cloud, Amazon beat them to it, but they are, I don't know who's stronger, Azure or, or Amazon Web Services, but Azure is platform as a service very strongly, where Amazon is still infrastructure as a service. So, uh, so Azure is more sophisticated, more aimed at the developers, where a Amazon is more the commodity, reducing the cost of on-prem systems. So they have a different strategy, but both giants, of course, in cloud. And uh, Microsoft saw how boring things like that got, uh, just the regular PC, and introduce things, something like that, the Surface. And I've got a, you know, a yoga, and uh, you know, it's beautiful. If anybody shows you their PC, Henry, and you want to start touching it, don't you? you, you know? <laughs> Why isn't this working? Because you combine touch screen with, uh, with key, key, keyboard. Yeah, I know, and it's beautiful. Now, I've, got, I've got a yoga. Mine just flips around. I don't have to pull things apart. But, but, but uh, that's... Uh, uh, because, because Microsoft wanted to shake up innovation in, in the laptop market and did so, did so very successfully. No, I can't afford it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but that sounds gorgeous. And this is the problem with Apple. Where's the Apple Fold? And the triple cameras in the in the 11 Pro, that Samsung's had that for a year or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where is it? One trick pony with the iPhone. Well, we're going to talk about it later. <laughs> later, later, later. So transformational, charismatic, Satya Nadella and Steve Jobs originally. Steve Vorma screwed, it up, screwed up Microsoft and maybe Tim Cook is strategic drift, suffering from strategic drift. We'll see. And we have transactional leaders here, hard levers for change, designing systems, targets, financial incentives, project manager, capital. That's very German. Siemens, Mercedes, BMW, very transactional. Very engineered solutions, very good quality, very reliable, but not, not flash and charismatic, very slow to slowly evolve their solutions. 
So we have these different styles. And again, it shows strategies and art. So transformational interactions, leadership styles are two ends, two ends. So the scale, we need this situational leadership. We need this leadership that style to situation match. It depends. I can be a real cheapskate, hard-nosed, get the rent up, get the cost down. I'm a landlord here, ROI, to, oh, shit, we could, we could move the kitchen from here to here and create another room that could be my study or something here or 100 grand, no problem, you know. In the same breath, that's this idea of situation. Depending on the situation, one is uh, a home, an asset, adding value to an asset, enjoying the asset, a good investment. The other one is managing a rental property. So styles. This comes from Biz Stone, founder of Twitter. He says you have to learn to lead, that we're not born as leaders, we need coaches. I suggest that to you. I did this when, uh, when I was your age. At work, you're going to work for somebody. Your boss is either going to be really sharp and good or not so, not so sharp and good, yes? If your boss is really sharp, learn, 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 copy. Oh, that's clever. I see the way he or she did this or that or the other and adopt it. That's going to be you next time. The things your boss is doing badly, oh, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't work at all. That's how you learn to lead. You learn by example. You learn from the people around you. You may not be in that management position today. You don't start at the top and work your way down. You already know it. The bachelor's students think that they're going to start at the top. Uh, but you start, yeah, so you start at the bottom and work your way up. But, but be observed. That's how you learn, learn to lead. When you are in a position, I appointed Marlena. She's really sharp. She's my property manager uh, for this rental property. I'm delighted with my choice. She really knows her game. You have to select and empower she said, oh, we've got a lot of interest. And I sent her a page from Domain that showed waterfront, we're the cheapest. And then she came back, well, you know, you've got the old kitchen and, and you're further away and that, da, da, da. I said, oh, you know your stuff. That's fine. That's fine. She got very defensive <laughs> when I gave her a little, little bit of a criticism. So I shouldn't have done that, maybe. She saw that as being a bit critical. So, uh, but what I said is, well, you know your stuff now. And that's why I've left it to you. And so you have to empower. You have to empower your staff. You, you, otherwise, uh, look, if you've got a dog, why are you doing the barking? Got to let them. Um, you have to have vision and grit. So you have to know where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So you have to know where you're going. But grit... Things will go wrong. Shit will happen. Grit, there's a movie um, about Rooster Cogburn. Uh, was played by uh, John Wayne. And then a very good actor did the remake. I can't remember his name. He was very, very good. Uh, he's, he's a very good actor doing, doing the remake. It's called True Grit. And it's an American term, what Americans talk about in terms of grit. And Rooster Cogburn embodies true grit. This is really good security. I can go into stat 395 and I can change all the results now. <laughs> we have great security here at this university. <laughs> Happens every week, every day. I've got, I look at another iLearn unit that's logged in and I can go in and change everything. Yeah, and they should time it out. Should have a timeout, like like online banking. Should time out, not not there. So the 2010. Uh, 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 no, no, no. The, the, this, the original one's John Wayne. This is that. This is John Wayne. Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges. So Jeff Bridges plays plays Rooster Cogburn, and this is um, John Wayne the original True Grit. Anyway, have a look at it. That's your homework, is watch True Grit. It's a very good movie. And no, of course not. That costs them money. It's a, it's a good movie. It's a popular movie. Netflix won't pay for that. 
Maybe in 10 years' time they will. They've got some Netflix just released, some um, uh, Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> Ram, Ram, Ram Rowan. Ram. <laughs> I mean, oh God almighty, that's, that's 10 or 15 years. At least they've got Breaking Bad movie. Um, oh, Jess, so you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Jess, yeah. Jesse Pinkman. But oh, without, without Walter White, I'm not sure, you know, whether it's all that good. I think we're digressing. My point is that Just Rooster Crogburn has true grit. He's incredibly tough. Old coot, but he's tough. He can keep on going. Yeah, well, you need grit. In other words, you get knocked down, what do you do? Get back up. Get straight back up again. Throw a few punches of your own, maybe, too. It may not work, but at least you'll feel better. <laughs> so true. So you have to have grit. And finally, confidence. In other words, you may not be sure, but don't let the troops know. According to Bizstone, appear confident. So approaches to leading change depends on the context. It varies. And there's a kaleidoscope of factors in terms of change. How quickly does it need to be done? What's the scope? What needs to be preserved? How diverse is the situation? What's the capability of staff? What capacity do they have for change? What's their readiness? And what power do you have? It's really an art in how to deliver change. But I really like the story of George Yip. Read it. Uh, in the text about the Rotterdam School of Management and how he addressed it. He had four years and how he did it. Didn't I announce we're changing? There's an immediate change. Well, no, 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 we're not changing. There would be resistance. He just did it. He walked the talk. We talked about Tony Abbott and he was all hat and no cowboy. In other words, he didn't walk the talk. And he got ousted finally. In Manly, that's his seat. <laughs> Might bump into him. Styles of change leadership according to the capability and readiness. So if they're high, high readiness and high capability, then you collaborate. Let's work together. Let's do this. If it's low readiness, then you have to participate. If it's, if it's um, low capability but high readiness, you have to persuade them. And if it's both low, um, you have to direct them. It's my way or the highway if it's urgent. But if it's not urgent, well, let's slowly work through this together. That all depends. All depends on the situation. Again, this is a situational grid. We can also do a force field analysis. We can work out the forces for us and exploit them and try and neg negate the forces against us. So here's an example of a Japanese multinational. They want to devolve strategy to the European subsidiaries. They realize that in Europe, the culture's different, the competition's different. If we just adopt our Japanese strategy, our Japanese way of doing things, it's suboptimum. We need to, to do it the European way in Europe. Sounds like a good idea. So pushing, because they've got local competitors and they're growing. We need to be competitive against them. That there's a customer. The customer wants things done the European way, not the Japanese way. Uh, it's bit, there's a head office decision and support to go with this. That um, if you align with the new European direction, your career will be enhanced, will give you lots of incentives to go over to Europe. To be the go-between, the liaison, because the European requirements need to literally be translated into Japanese and then figuratively translated into how the Japanese manufacturing hub is going to actually accommodate these new European requirements, how we're going to develop, if it's automobiles, for instance, how we're going to change the cars, rebadge them, and what changes are we going to make for the European market? And different European markets like Germany and France might, might well be different. Requirements, 
there's opportunities for synergies with our Europeans, with our distribution channel, with our dealers. And uh, there's development, management development here, new management roles, you'll get promoted. So these are the forces for. So you can exploit all of that, but there are resisting fo uh, fo uh, forces that there are silos of specialization, engineering, design, and now you want some engineering design done in Europe? <laughs> we don't like that. Uh, that um, we want everything to be Japanese. We don't want it to be European. There isn't an IT network, different systems. There's a, we don't want to share data with, with our European subsidiaries, our com competition. They have spies in there and uh, will steal all of our information. Um, that there's no pan-European local management, here no coordination, and we have lack of experience. So this is by mapping it out, you can then try and address all the forces that are resisting and exploit all the forces that are aligning with you. As Yip did, he worked out there'd be huge forces against him, he got rid of his opponents, he promoted his uh, uh, supporters, and he spent his time not interested in the PhD dissertation. I couldn't care less. Only interested in the liaison meetings with business. So that way, you see how he handled the force field. So very, very clever, true story. So types of change, it depends. It can be incremental or big bang, and if it's transformational, it's an evolution. If it's just a realignment, it's an adaption. If it's big bang transformational, that's a revolution. And if it's big bang with a realignment, it's a reconstruction or a bit of a turnaround. So there's different types of change. The way Yip did it is very clever. He snuck up on them over three years. He knew he had four years to go. And um, that way, he, he could do it in a calculated, organized fashion of changing focus and priority. Starbucks says that they succeed one cup of coffee at a time. And I tell my wife that. It's one customer at a time, converting each customer who comes in to give them, wow, you know, fantastic nails. She just changed her nails. She always changed her nails. And she's got these um, aqua green ones. And I said, oh, that looks nice. Aria did that, and she said, yeah, good work. No, not wow. It's okay. Not wow. In other words, she does them better. But she had to get her staff to do it because she's the boss. She can do her own nails, but she's the boss. So my point is that incremental you know, evolution, incremental adaptation is the, is the more logical. The Big Bang does it. It's very, very risky. Very, very hard to make that work. So Starbucks, one cup of coffee at a time, and my wife, you know, one customer at a time, slowly, surely convert each one, give them a convert. And, you know, uh, I come and pick her up, and I help, and, honey, can you, can you take the money? Yeah, 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 how much? Do I have a card or cash? Do you have one of our cards? And I give them all a loyalty card, and stamp the loyalty card. After four visits, you get $5 off. That's the strategy. I use Vistaprint. I think they're in, um, in India or wherever here. And it's so funny. You know, um, you know they, they cost like, like you know, six or seven cents each, the, the business cards. And then I know at the end they're going to give me 500 extra for another $10 or something. So I wait for that offer that comes through at the end, and I accept the offer. They've got a stack of these cards. And on the front, it's got Wendy's nails, you know. And so that, to me, you know, is this, this idea of incremental. Incremental is much uh, more pragmatic than trying to do a revolution. So at, we talked about those just now. So turnaround, turnaround, uh, it can be a crisis. Uh, there's a lot of management changes, but you need stakeholder support. You have to target and restructure. Um, Americans have restructuring that they, they you know, divest. I talked about Wes Farmers last week. They divested all their, their uh, coal mines. They've um, uh, sold coals. 
It's, it's had an IPO, uh, public offering. So there, there's a lot. There's a lot of diverse, uh, divestments that occur. Uh, Commonwealth Bank selling Cominsure, sending, selling the whole wealth management, all of their wealth advisors, whole area, all being divested. This is major turnaround because of the Hain Royal Commission. They got into huge trouble. Uh, their boss got fired, Matt Combins, the new, new boss. So turnaround, it could be either to increase revenue or, or, or divestment. It could be to reduce cost. It could be revolutionary here. Uh, it's likely to involve new strategic directions. Chasey, top management changes like the Hain Royal Commission. It drove through new, new changes in management here and a culture change being honest rather than dishonest. And you have to monitor the change. And APRA, Australian Prudential Re Regulation Authority, is monitoring the banks. That's why they're being very strict in their lending. They know they are under the microscope. That will keep a dampener on our property market because gaining finance is very difficult. But evolution is, is, is uh, um, well, they say arguably uh, uh, more, most challenging, but, uh, but I think all organizations like Apple, like Microsoft, they need to continue to evolve. Microsoft has, maybe Apple is stagnating. It's losing its place, you know. And so, so you have to cultivate this uh, ambidexterity, this ability to, to manage the status quo, but also to innovate. I had an innovation index when I was uh, a managing director that uh, I think it was like 30% um, of my sales had to come from products launched in the last five years. I had to obsolete my own products. If I don't, somebody else will. And this is part of the balanced scorecard idea of innovation and learning in the balanced scorecard. So structurally, uh, ambi um, uh, ambidexterity, uh, so ambidextrous means you're left and right-handed. Um, and Alphabet is an example, has the core uh, Google business, but it has ventures and X and very entrepreneurial, very entrepreneurial business units. And we need diversity and we need a culture, an entrepreneurial culture of questioning and challenge. We need the right type of leadership and, and tight systems to prevent theft and to keep business as usual and to return um, dividends to shareholders, the tight financial systems, but also loose systems in terms of investment in things like skunk works. Cotto's Eight Steps for Change. You can read that yourself. And then the levers for change. We need a compelling case. It could be a change of regulation, change of market. Uh, uh, Alan Joyce um, created a, a huge controversy over Qantas. Qantas lost close to a billion dollars, had a huge loss one year. And it was because of skyrocketing fuel prices. And Qantas uh, complained to the government that uh, the reason it, it's in potentially going to be in trouble is because its ownership is too restrictive. That um, it requires 51% Australian ownership. It's still Australia's uh, airline. Um, and uh, Virgin is, uh, for instance, majority foreign owned. So Qantas complained it, 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 it's not a um, level playing field and it wants foreign investment. And what Alan Joyce was trying to do is not waste a good crisis. The government said no, and Qantas, most of the billion dollar loss was right down of non-cash losses, right down of uh, new, new, new planes and everything. And Qantas has, has become, as we saw when we looked at Ryanair, has become very profitable. The government was right in resisting, resisting the uh, uh, push from Alan Joyce. So, Never waste a, <laughs> a good crisis is the motto. He tried, but he failed. In other words, a crisis is an opportunity to instigate change in your organization. So it can often be due to a crisis here, um, creating a compelling case. We can then challenge the taken for granted. We can change our processes and routines. And management needs to be very symbolic, you know, a change and, and new power in political systems. So changing processes, 
we have to plan for it, we have to challenge our assumptions, how we do things around here, and we need to change from bottom up how people do things. And it can be very symbolic with new rituals, um, we have new locations, new attire, new offices, new behavior, new language, how we talk about the business. And you can read this yourself about different rituals and change. Um, that there's politics involved because of the control of resources, expertise and information. And we, we have to negotiate the politics for poor Boris, whether he's able to do that at the moment and deliver a Brexit deal, we'll see. Support with the elites and the stakeholders, and we have to build alliances and networks. And whether he's been able to do that and deliver Brexit will be a very interesting question, which we'll know by next week. I said, oh, we won't. It's not 31st yet. They might delay it till the last minute. It might go down to the wire. So there are political mechanisms. We have to build our power base. We have to overcome resistance, achieve compliance. And I gave you Yip's example here. Um, George Yip is a very, very good example of how he did it. And the timing, we need to build on an actual perceived crisis, never waste a good crisis, exploit the windows of opportunity, symbolic signaling here, and having short-term wins. Lots of pro problems with a formal change program. It's death by planning. You can have a loss of focus. It's reinterpreted. It's disconnected. Very hard to get compliance. Uh, there's huge resistance. And then people see it as a violation of trust. So JFD, I just do it. Don't talk about it. Don't plan for it. You'll just have huge resistance. And formal programs, a lot of change happens, regardless of formal programs, that employees often continually adapt anyway. They underestimate the spontaneous emergent change. Um, don't get in the way of local adaptations, and your job is to be the coach to encourage and multiply successful local adaptations. I wouldn't have thought of offers over 800. Marlene thought of, thought of that, or Marlena is her name, like Marlena Dietrich. So Marlena thought of that. Uh, that I thought, oh, well, yeah, okay, do it. Bottom up. Let those in the know Let's make suggestions. So, leading change. George Yip is a very good example, and Satya Nadella is another example, and we've got a very good case study of Apple. Where is Apple headed? How did they get to where they were? And Tim Cook, where are they headed? What do we think? And there's a lot of very interesting commentary on what is now, I think, the fifth largest company in the world. Microsoft is now the number one company. So through very good leadership of change, such an Adela. Anyway, take a break, but read the Apple case study, and then I'll allocate questions. So, by the way, that's the end of the formal lectures, the end of Johnson, and I'm sure you'll enjoy revising Johnson for the exam.